everyone, let's uh, move on to the next next uh, talk. The first uh, talk from the industrial perspective. So our first uh, industrial speaker is Luca from Orsco. Uh, Luca is the head of energy economics at Orsco. I told you already, Orsco is the largest power producer uh, in Denmark with a lot of in the forefront of uh, renewable energy projects, I would say. Uh, she has extensive experience in the Danish energy regulation environment and is now applying the knowledge at the cutting edge of industry. Uh, Luca holds a master's degree in environmental economics. So Luca, thank you so much for joining us and staying with us. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot and thank you for, uh, for inviting me. It's, uh, it's the first time I've been in a, doing a presentation in such a room where people are sitting all over. So hope, hopefully I, I managed to speak to all of you. But uh, <laughs> yeah, let me know if you have any questions. Please interrupt during the speak if you have any questions or anything. Um, and I will try to, to pick up if, uh, if I can answer. Yeah, as you heard, I'm an uh, environmental economist. I'm not an engineer. So uh, it was hard for me to follow the last presentation. So um, this will be a bit more on the, on the higher level, uh, just to warn you. So uh, just a, a little about the energy economics team in Oslo. We are part of the regulatory team working with all the regulatory topics that is interesting for Oslo. Um, that means right now that we are working a lot of, uh, we are working very much with the energy uh, market model, which is up for discussion in Brussels in EU. Uh, and then in a Danish context, very much on these uh, energy islands that uh, the government has uh, decided to build in Denmark, one in, uh, in the Baltic Sea and one in, uh, in the North Sea. So uh, I will uh, focus on that in my presentation. Uh, we're also working uh, with the PTX uh, hydrogen uh, uh, regulation and uh, all, a lot of other topics. Um, first, uh, very shortly on Astor, for those of you that doesn't know us, we are a state-owned uh, Danish company. Um, used to be called Dong Energy until, I guess it's about seven, eight years ago. Uh, we changed our name to Astor uh, as a part of, uh, of decarbonizing uh, the company. Um, so today we are, we are three main uh, business units and an upcoming one. Um, the, the overall biggest one is the offshore wind business. Um, we are a global leader in offshore wind, build the first wind, firm, wind farms uh, offshore and it's also today uh, having a capa capacity of uh, 9 gigawatt running out there, uh, 3 gigawatts uh, about to be installed. So that means that we are the, the biggest um, owner of offshore wind uh, in the world. Uh, so our business model is that we, uh, we develop, we construct and we operate the wind farms. Uh, we can farm down selling part of it uh, to financial uh, partners. And some of the wind farms we also own together with other uh, energy companies, but mostly we uh, um, we operate them uh, ourselves. Um, and the ambition is to reach uh, 30 gigawatts, about 30 gigawatts of installed capacity by 2030 of offshore wind. Um, then we have a business unit uh, looking for onshore renewables, um, primarily in US, but also enter into Europe now, uh, first in, in Ireland where we have bought some, uh, some big onshore uh, capacities. Uh, same business model, develop, operate and own, uh, solar PV and uh, storage projects. Uh, you know, onshore wind, uh, solar PV and storage projects. And the ambition is to reach around seven and a half gigawatt uh, installed capacity in 2030. So we are still a, a new uh, newcomer, you can say, on onshore wind. Um, but, uh, but we have quite big ambitions uh, to, uh, to uh, develop that area as well. Then we ha have our Danish um, power plants, um, uh, all of them running on bioenergy, uh, wood pellets and uh, wood chips, um, producing uh, district heat for the, uh, for the big cities in, uh, in Denmark. And um, we have just uh, two weeks ago, uh, want a CCN, CCS tender in Denmark, carbon capture and storage. 
So we're gonna capture the CO2 from uh, from the chimney of two of the uh, Danish power plants uh, in 2025. So that's uh, that's a big project, and I think it will be the world's first uh, large scale uh, carbon capture um, facility on a biomass plant. And, and uh, so that that's a pretty interesting project. Then uh, a newcomer uh, as well, uh, renewable hydrogen and green fuels. Um, we uh, have the ambition to be a leader in this new uh, business focus area uh, for uh, supporting the decarbonizing of, uh, of Europe and also the uh, rest of the world. Um, producing uh, hydrogen, what we call green hydrogen or renewable hydrogen from primarily offshore wind but also from our onshore assets, hopefully, um, and selling it to uh, either a hydrogen grid or directly to end consumers uh, producing, using hydrogen. Um, so, uh, so, and uh, it's uh, small numbers in the, in the uh, you can see at the slide here, but, uh, but we have great ambitions um, to be a part of scaling up that industry in the, in the coming decades. Um, very shortly on our history, uh, 2007, we were a, a, a company mainly uh, focusing on oil and gas production from the North Sea uh, and uh, burning coal on our bio, uh, on our power plants in Denmark, uh, and also be a gas trader. So it was a very fossil fuel uh, depending uh, company, um, yeah. and then we decided that we want to turn that around and be a global green um, major instead. So that means that our CO2 reduction has uh, dropped dramatically, 88% uh, since 2007. We have uh, converted the, uh, the, the uh, share of renewables in our uh, revenue stream, in our EBITDA, um, from being only 7% to be 85%, uh, with the targets of being um, close to 200 uh, very soon. And then renewable capacity, has uh, increased uh, dramatically, and we also been become a more profit, um, a, a company with a better profit, um, earning more money. So that has really been a, in a good story that you can turn your company from black to green and still um, give your uh, your shareholders a, a decent result. Um, and why do we do that? Um, we are driven by, uh, by the climate crisis, um, that, that we take it very seriously, that we have a problem. Um, and uh, we wanna be in front of, uh, of uh, trying to, to support that we, uh, that we win this battle and uh, that we reduce our, um, our, our climate um, footprint or, um, and the greenhouse gas emissions. So um, yes, a question? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, a part of it was to sell off the black part. Uh, so we sold our oil uh, and gas uh, activities in the North Sea to another company. So you can see they continue, but under another uh, company. Uh, and then uh, for the coal-fired power plants, they were converted to biomass. So they stopped running on coal, you can say. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, then investing in a lot of renewables. So that's that's part of it. Yeah. How do you depend on the demand for fossil fuels for that? It. Uh, I will come back to that a bit. It it was very very dependent on on subsidies, but now we can see that that the costs have come down, and now offshore wind is very close to be a, a a business that you can invest in without subsidies. So so that's also part of the story that you cannot do this alone. You can do this together with the politicians. But you also need someone to lean out and take the investments. And For some of them, yes. Um, a lot of like like the story that it was a sell-off, that it was a divestment. Then a lot of the people left with the company, you can say. But for those, there is people that stayed and and transformed themselves with the company. Whether they buy in on the green transition or whether they buy in on the business model, I don't know. But there is still people that 
that just work because they think it's uh, from an engineering perspective interesting project. But there is also a culture that we would like to be green. And I can, I, I've been in Asta since 2010, and then I left from 15 to 18. And I could see when I came back that a change has happened. So when you recruit people, for example, a lot of people is applying because they believe in the green transition. So, so, so it is a company culture, but there's still room for the people that is not going to work because of the green transition and just, just because they think they have an interesting job. But, but, but we kept a lot of employees returning or um, reforming their company. Yeah, sorry. It's a yeah. I think one of the reason was that offshore was a big part of the company. So it was not just something we did in a department somewhere, but it was at that point when they took the decision, it was it was a big part of our company. So for us, in a way, it was not it it was our main activity, and then it's more easily to to I won't say get rid of, but to work on to reduce other part of the companies when you have something to build on. So, and I think for the for the oil majors, they are also very, uh, and Shell was <laughs> until recently very focusing on increasing that part of the business. But as long as it's not the first point of your agenda in your, in your board meetings, then it's just something we do because of, of what? Our bread and butter is somewhere else. So I think for Erstel it was also to find a bread and butter because we were not a yeah, we were a big oil company in, in a Danish context, but not in a worldwide context. And we were not a big power plant owner in a worldwide context. So, so it's e sometimes it's easier to be a small company, you can say, when you want to transform. I, 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 I believe that's the, the little boring description. I would like to say because we just wanted to do it, but, but I think it is harder. It is harder for the big companies to turn around. Other questions, yeah? Um, in Denmark, most of our production is sold on the on the North Pool, or it's sold on the Nordic market. So it depends a bit on whether you look at the Nordic market or the Danish market. Because yes, we were a dominating, and still is, I guess. I don't know if in legal term we are dominating, but we are behave like we are dominating a, a producer in Denmark as well. Um, I can't remember the market shares in my head, but. Today we are producing 30% of the district heating in Denmark. Um, I think it's been around that level for for a while. Um, now I'm thinking if it's 30% of the heating or district heating, but I think it's even 30% of the heating in Denmark. So it's it's a higher share of the district heating. Um, on the electricity market, I I, I don't want to try because I can't remember, but. I don't think it has changed that much. I mean, the reason for changing is that you are running, the power plant is running much less due to electricity demand today. We did last year. <laughs> we were running very, mu very much on our power plants. But, but today they mostly run because of the heat market. 
and then they sell the excess electricity into the to the market to a very low marginal cost, you can say. Um, so yes, we are when you are dominating on the market on renewable prices go down and prices has gone down in the Danish market, but since you are trading a lot with our neighbors, we, we keep the market price up. It's very often the Norwegians that sets the price because they have the uh, the hydropower, so they can control it. So they very often set the price in the, in, the, in the market. So we don't have many hours with negative prices. We have lower prices, prices and of course that affects our revenue if they were on market, market terms. But as we heard before, a lot of it is subsidy driven and it, they were on fixed market price. So you get a fixed price the first 10, 12 years. So Enholt, uh, which is the last uh, Danish wind farm we have built, it's in fact, it's a bit embarrassing that it's 11 years ago, but it was uh, it's 11, 12 years ago. So they're running out of subsidies now, now. so they're running on market terms now. And I, I'm pretty sure the wind farm still earns money. But um, but of course, it is an issue. And I will say it's, it hasn't been an issue because it was still a, a small share of the total market. But it will be coming and increasing. A lot of people is discussing, can we have this market model in the future where we have so many low marginal cost renewables running, we still believe because you will still have a demand side. And, and uh, it's, a long, it's a longer story about how the electricity market works, but we believe that the market will still send the, the right price signals. Also, with the new demand coming in from electrolyzers producing hydrogen, for example, that we, you will also increase demand and that will, will help you uh, you have, have, have better prices in the system. But, but it is a real issue. But in, until now, it, have, it hasn't hit that yet. So, should I jump on? Yeah. Um, yeah, you uh, thought something about if they are still uh, in the subsidy story and, and the economy in, in, uh, in wind turbines. I really like this picture because it has shown how much the industry has developed in, uh, in a, it's a long period, but, but still a, a, a fairly short period. Uh, also, since the first couple of years, there were I don't I think Denmark was the only country in the world that has offshore wind. So for many many years, it was it was really a, a very very tiny industry. But one of the uh, story behind the, the cost reduction uh, that has been in offshore wind, and um, my next slides will come into how much the cost reduction has been, is that the turbines become bigger, the sites sites become bigger. The first one. Um, called Vinneby, uh, built in Denmark in uh, 1991. It was a five megawatt offshore wind farm, <laughs> a, a very, very small one. I think it was, a, yeah, you could say 0 0.5 megawatt, sorry, uh, um, uh, per wind turbine. So it was 10, 10 wind turbines standing out there, uh, creating a five megawatt wind uh, farm. Today, uh, the last one, uh, the, the recent one we are working on is a uh, Horn C3 in, um, in the UK, which is a 2.1 uh, gigawatt uh, offshore wind farm, uh, so so that's where the industry has uh, has uh, has developed, uh, and and also the, the size of each turbine. Now we are we are investing in 12 megawatt uh, wind turbines, and they are 260 meter high. Um, very very huge. I don't know if any one of you, if if you are anyone is from Denmark. We have a test site in uh, the northern part of Jutland where they put them on, on land. I went there two years ago and if you stand that close to a 260 meter tall wind turbine, it's, it's really, really huge. So, um, so that's part of the story. Larger turbines, larger sites, cost reductions. The industry has just become more uh, professional. Uh, shorter installation cycles. We were much more efficient with taking the ships out uh, offshore and then uh, going home again. It's really, really expensive to rent a vessel to go offshore. Um, operation and maintenance we worked on. And then, uh, yeah, yes, it's simply a supply chain that have a cost cost. So it has been a, been a journey, of course, uh, industrialis industrialization of the industry and also driven by, by many more players out there investing uh, in the wind turbines. So what happened to cost 2012? It was a very, uh, I guess that's even based on Anhalt, maybe the, the recent Danish uh, Danish wind farm. Um, 
now this is in pound because, uh, uh, sorry, it is, it is euro, sorry. Yeah, it is in euro. Um, but a lot of it is, is driven from the, from the UK market because they were very, they have built a lot uh, offshore wind since 2012. Um, going from 177 uh, euros in, um, in 12 to estimated around 50, 71 euros in uh, 22. And you can see, of course, everything depends on assumptions and so on. So, so don't hang up on the actual numbers. It's also intervals. But you can see that now we are at a level where we can compete with the new fossil fuels, for sure. And uh, to some extent also for existing uh, fossil fuels that is not on the picture. And also on nuclear. Uh, the last nuclear plant in Europe has been very expensive. Um, onshore and solar, they are still cheaper. But they also limit in how much you can build. Offshore is, of course, also a limit. We only have the sea space that we have available. But uh, there is no neighbors out there, and that makes it very much easier to build um, big, big uh, offshore wind farms than, than it is onshore. So that means that even if they are still cheaper, you, you might not, and I'll come a bit back to that, be able to, to use them to decarbonize Europe because we simply run out of space on land. Uh, before we hit it. So today we have, um, we have in Germany, we have uh, one merchant wind farm that we are building on completely merchant terms, uh, no subsidies. And there's just been last week uh, announced the result of the last offshore wind tender in uh, Germany. And uh, all of the bidders has bidded for no subsidy. So now there will be a second round where they will bid for who will pay the most for the concession, for the, uh, the access to the sea. So now it has return, uh, turned around from being uh, an industry that needs a subsidy to an industry that, that will pay for having uh, access to build uh, on the offshore, uh, on the seaside, because of course it's, it's owned by, by the states, uh, the sea. And the last tender in Denmark was also with a positive payment to the Danish state. Um, so that's, that's where where we the industry is right now and of course it's uh it's i think my i can't remember if i bought it no i i left that slide out but it's it is really it has been the politician leaned out and set up ambitious target and the industry followed with a very ambition uh, cost reduction uh, uh, strategy and then more offshore was of course tendered out while they could see costs come down and then and so that's really a success story what what the industry and politician can do together um, if we really um, invest in uh, in an industry, uh, yeah. Still remains to be seen. Um, last year, no uh, final investments decision was taken on, uh, on offshore wind in the world. So that's really a result of an uncertain market so that no one has that did there to take the investment decision. Um, it is equal for all the industries, you can say, that costs has increased. So if you compare the, the technologies against each other, I guess it's, the issue will be equal. Um, but of course, the existing technology doesn't need support, so, and they are the one that sets the price. So it really depends on what will happen with electricity prices. Um, they have come down. Um, who will guess on where, what level they will be? It depends so much on the gas prices. So it really remains to be seen. Um, we have this uh, upcoming industry act um, from EU. Um, will they start to give subsidies, subsidize, uh, subsidize the supply chain? That could be something that could reduce costs. But um, it's a very, very good question, and it's, uh, it's hard to tell where it will go. It's, hopefully, it won't end like that, but it, it could be a result of it, that we simply cannot afford it to the same prices as we did before. I don't know which one, who of you that were first, but... Uh, yeah. It 
differs from country to country. Um, in Denmark, we uh, the last one in Denmark, Tor, we build the infrastructure as well. In UK, we build the infrastructure. In Germany and in Holland, is is it the, the Netherlands? Is it the local TSO? So it differs from market to market. Um, and in, in the tour tender, it was uh, the concession payment was including the cost of the cable, so it was still still paid uh, money back to the state, even though we built the state. So, but it, but it differs. A lot of things differs from country to country. <laughs> yeah. You, you. Yes, uh, and in fact, we just have our capital market days, which is. Uh, a day where we uh, talk a lot to an investors uh, two weeks ago. And uh, at that uh, day, we announced this 80-20% uh, <laughs> in a lot of our, uh, our strategies. So yes, uh, for the 2030 target, around 80% will be uh, bottom fixed and 20% will be floating, which we assume. But it remains, we have a big floating project in Ireland, but uh, Scotland, Scotland, sorry. But uh, it's still a uh, very upcoming industry. <laughs> yeah. Yes? Um, perhaps by your introduction of uh, Russian prices, uh, did the 2023 picture show your gas price to go very high? Because you put it the year before, and I was curious if that was just heavy and it is still a little bit so low. Oh, if, if, if the gas prices is, I don't think it's LCE, so it's the, construction cost ah. so uh, of course there is the uh, for the fossil days uh, but I I am pretty sure it's not with the uh, with the low scenarios I'm pretty sure it's not with the updated cost because then it will be cheating a bit so I'm pretty sure it was it's it's with the older gas prices than the 22 I'm pretty sure but it is it is still competitive even if yeah, yeah. other questions It's only a part of the story. I fully agree. Um, so, my main story with with this slice is the two first uh, uh, costs. You can say so. It's the story about offshore wind has brought levelized cost of electricity down to be com competitive on the levelized costs on other uh, uh, renewables. So, so of course you can uh, you can challenge and and we also tried a lot of times to put up integration costs but it's also very very complicated because in the danish market they might not be so high because we are very much uh, very well integrated to our neighbors so until now it hasn't been so expensive if you look at an island uk for example it's another story um so it still remains to put but we are, what we also work on is that for an offshore wind farm uh, I think it was Danish numbers, only 2% of a year there was no offshore wind running. So it would also be better and better. I mean, we all, the turbines become better and better that we can utilize the wind on very low speed and they are not shut down completely at high speed. So you also work on the technology to make it better and better. Um, and and we also had did had a part of the company was looking into this uh, i can't remember what we call it but it was the uh, the strategy was to be fully disposable uh, dispatchable so so that we offered to the grid that we were running 24/7 right now there's no payments uh, 
availability. Uh, you know, the, the TSO doesn't is not that interested in that product, so they can still control it yet. But maybe later. Um, so it is. It is. It's something we work on. But um, so yes, it's only a part of the story. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's seven percent. No, I think it says in the notes. It's the same hurdle rate used for the, all the technologies. Yeah, it's not that it's it. The data is from Bloomberg, and I can't remember what they use, but they use the same rate for all of them. So there is a return, but I can't remember what the name is. The number is. Um. Yeah, I won't spend so much time on this. It's more like maybe to to, to double click on the on the uh, on the twenty thirty targets is to uh, and and this is also this is not for us though. This is globally. There is a lot of appetite for renewables, of course, and it may be not of course, but uh, luckily enough, uh, politician has reacted uh, on the climate and also on the uh, fossil fuels uh, uh, shortage. You can say. Um, that we we expect to see a tremendous growth in uh, in renewable energy uh, investments during the next uh, eight years, uh, seven years. This is only now. Um, so so for a company like us, of course, uh, a lot of opportunities, and we hope that we can uh, we can be be a important player in this uh, the journey the, the next uh, eight years. Um, Returning a bit, oh, that was the slide I, I, I was thinking about before, this thing about policy makers creating the demand, industry invest in innovation and supply chain. Cost come down, lower cost means that politicians get appetite for more. So that's really behind the, the model for, for offshore wind. And that has led to uh, this picture, which was really a, really a big win for an offshore industry. Um, Speaking also about energy systems and how to get the system up running. Uh, a couple of years ago, EU came out with, with this um, net zero target plan. And they made a model uh, calculation, figuring out how should we decarbonize the electricity system in the most cost efficient way. And one of the scenarios they came out with was this um, tech scenario where they were focusing on the technology should solve the problem, you can say. In others of the scenarios was the very increased demand. There is energy efficiency in this one, but there was like a change of mind reducing demand. But but we believe that this scenario is the most um, the, the, yeah, the, the most uh, like, likely, you can say, um, because we believe that, I guess, we don't have so much belief in people will change their behavior dramatically. So in this scenario, we still have an industry, uh, have, a, have a world that wants with growth and so on and so on. And EU said, OK, we need direct electrification, electrification um, which would increase. So this is electricity consumption, a huge increase in electricity consumption in EU um, with direct electrification around 50% of the consumption, PTX, the, the, the green hydrogen, and then the losses in the grid and so on. So that will increase our electricity consumption in the EU with two and a half, um, yeah, two and a half times. Um, and then they also made an energy modeling saying who should uh, provide this electricity, which technologies. And you can see onshore wind, a third of it, really, really an important part. And this is um, production, uh, offshore wind, uh, a little less than 20%, solar, the same, other renewables, around the same, and then nuclear. And then we still have some fossil fuel left in, uh, in 2030. So this, if you translate this uh, offshore wind, 70%, um, it's around 450 gigawatt um, coming from an industry with a global, and uh, I think we have a global capacity of less than 20 gigawatts. <coughs> it should be scaled up to 450 gigawatt in Europe um, before uh, 2050. So this is really a, Really, uh, and it 
the slide I had before with costs come down and politicians set ambitious target, it was really a result of the cost reduction that, that offshore wind could be such a big part of, of this, uh, this modeling. Um, on the other hand, there's also this electricity production picture also comes with a lot of uh, new challenges. And uh, infrastructure is also an important part of, of, of the new decarbonized electricity system because today we very much have our, our power plants and so on located, clo uh, located close to consumption. Back to history, consumption has located where the energy was, especially if you look at Germany where you have the southern part of Germany, very heavy industry. That was where the coal-fired power plants and the nuclear power plants was located. To, to in the future, we, we, we have to build the renewable sources where the renewables are. So, or for example, speaking of offshore wind, it will be very much be in the northern part of, of Europe. So it's also a part of the picture that we need grid to transport the electrons from the big um, renewable energy areas to the to consumers. We don't believe that German industry will move that much. Um, so so the, the electricity has to move uh, to the consumers. But if, and then that means it can come with a really, really high cost on grid build out the 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 the, um, uh, the decarbonization but but what i will focus a bit on, on on the rest of my time is to how do we get those this investment these investments without building just as much grid as we used to do when we uh, when we uh, when we transport the electrons to from from production to consumers um so you can see it's high number um 800 billion euros by 2030, expected investment. Um, and then uh, the grid build out is, uh, is around two thirds of that. Um, and and, and we, can, we can reduce those costs uh, if we do it in a, in a clever way. Um, so what we focusing on and, and what uh, ended out to be these two islands that we are working on in Denmark and uh, Belgium has also decided to build an island uh, is that until now we have built offshore wind farms, connected them directly to shore. That was the model directly to the to the transmission grid uh, on shore. In the future, we will see uh, multi connections where we uh, will connect offshore wind farms to uh, one or more countries, or two or more countries. We have one example in Denmark, Kriers Flak, that is connected both to Germany and to Denmark. Um, and we will see more and more of these because then you can uh, you can share uh, the infrastructure much more, um, and you can also utilize that that the one market depends on the need your your electricity in other hours than the other markets. So of course you get access to two markets instead, and then you can also use the uh, the, the, the direct lines you can say from the wind farm as an interconnector. So if the wind is not blowing, you can use it for trading. So you get a much more better. Uh, utilization of your infrastructure. So a 40% reduction in the amount of interconnectors you need to decarbonize euro is, is a model calculation um, that was made by combining the offshore wind with interconnectors and make those meshed grid, you can say, out in and offshore. That's, that's the goal target, you can say, in the, in the future. So we see it as this stepwise approach where you start by doing the multi-connections multi then you think about where to locate your PTX production, uh, locate, locate them near to the, um, to the renewable energy uh, source so you don't have to transport the electrons so far. It's much cheaper and much easier to transport molecules than electrons. So transfer it if you don't need it as electricity, um, transfer it into, um, to uh, hydrogen or other uh, green fuels instead and transport them like that. That, that, that will really reduce the cost. And again, a 20% reduction in the need for interconnectors. Um, in the future, we might see, so that's what we will believe with the new Danish islands is these two, two first steps. In the future, we might see that we put the offshore, no, we put the PTX production out offshore we don't see it as very likely in the first round because it's just very, very expensive to operate offshore. 
and you need a lot of space to put an electrolyzer out offshore. So to build an island is expensive. To build an island with enough space, if enough, enough space for electrolyzers will be very, very expensive. But we might see that technology development will make it possible in the future. And then the end targets, which probably will, should be the end 2050, uh, will be to have this mesh network where the electrons can flow wherever, or the molecules will flow wherever you need them uh, out in the grid. So that's the journey we see that we are on, uh, speaking about infrastructure and how to connect uh, and utilize the, uh, the electrons from the offshore wind. Um, yes? A big challenge. <laughs> um, that 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 that's the part. One of the one of the issues that we're working on right now. The model that EU has uh, has suggested is to make an offshore bidding zone. So you will have a bidding zone without any consumption. And that's when we talk to our traders, they say, okay, how can you have a market with no demand? Um, good question. Um, so but, so that creates a lot of challenges. But 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 it's the most efficient way of doing it on the paper. You can say it will send the right uh, price signals to the offshore wind farm and so on. But, but, um, but there is, um, there's many um, regulatory interesting topics uh, surrounded by it um, that has to be solved. But right now, uh, I think the CRIAS flag model is what they call a home market model. So it's uh, part of DK2. So that's the model they have chosen for the first one, but it's, it won't be like that in the future because it's not, it's not efficient. But it's a, it's a, you can say a um, dispensation <laughs> system. You know, they have chosen that. So, yeah. Speak up. I, I think. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, but for example, on the Bonholm Island, uh, how the, the system is dimensioned is that you have a two gigawatt cable to Germany and you have a 1.2 gigawatt cable to Denmark and then you have a three gigawatt wind farm. So you can say it can still operate full to the German market and be curtailed for the Danish market and the opposite. So, so it depends a lot of your capa capacities, but yes, if you... Uh, it will probably, I mean, if there's full capacity to one market, you can probably just send the, the electrons to that because it's DC connection, so you can, you can cut the electricity and send it in that direction. So it, I don't think that will be an issue, but, but of course you can design it, so it will be an issue. Um, yes? I agree in your first two points. I tend to disagree a bit in the third one. Um, yes, an offshore bidding zone will have low prices, but the lowest of the two prices. Um, but you also save some, some infrastructure because you connect to the island offshore instead of having a long cable to onshore. So you also save some money as, a, as an investor. But, um, but we also, I mean, I think I come back to it a bit on the market model on a hybrid, that a hybrid or an island, that it has to be interesting for both parties to go there. So if the interconnector earns a lot of money and the offshore wind is not in the money, 
then we would not be interested in connecting to the island. So what will be the next, also coming back to your last question, this cost-benefit sharing model, cross-border cost-benefit sharing model, you call it, that, that is currently discussed in EU? That is, you also be discussing on a kind of cost-benefit sharing between the, the parties on the island. Because if the TSOs earn a lot from congestion income and the offshore wind farm is not in the money, should there be some way of redistribute cost, a lot of money, uh, the benefit, uh, revenue from one to another? That's an that's a interesting discussion to come. Um, on your second point about cannibalization, yes, and to some extent, that's also the reason why we are active in PTX. Because PTX, you have a, you can you can uh, produce a product that someone is interested in buying, and if you can produce that product in a competitive price, then it doesn't matter how much you earn for your wind farm. You can say, so you in feed the offshore wind farm to your to your hydrogen production, and then you sell that. If you can get money in that one, then it's not so important what the electricity price is on the market anymore. So that's also a way to enter into a new kind of economy. Um, so you not only produce to the grid, because yes, there will be low prices in the market for many hours in the future. But then if I'm an investor in a shoe factory or something like that, and there's low prices all the time, I will start to consume some electricity. So we also be believe that, that demand should increase if, if prices become so low. Um, on your point about the, the market reform, um, I don't believe that there's anything wrong with the current market. Uh, I think it's, uh, it's, it's uh, and the last year, uh, it has shown that it is sufficient. So prices came up, people reduced their, their, their consumption because of the prices came up. We had an efficient market telling us, reacting on the signals into the system. So I, I believe that we have a market that is well-functioned. Do we invest enough based on market on electricity prices? You can criticize that, but there has also been a lot of political intervention in the market for many years with subsidies and so on, forcing electricity into the market. So we as Asta still believe that it's the best market model we, we have. And our questions for, for the commission and for the member states is to keep their hands away because we think that the most dangerous part will be to make revenue caps and start to in intervene, intervene in the market because then you create uncertainty and then you can't invest. So as long as the politicians keep away and let prices, prices rise, it's completely fair that you have to compensate some vulnerable consumers, completely fair, but stay out of the market because it's exactly what we want the market signals to, to work for. So, and of course, there can be some windfall profit that you should also maybe try to control. Uh, we understand that as well, uh, with that extreme situation we saw last year. But, um, so our wishes to the market reform is that it becomes as little as possible. <laughs> Any other questions at this moment? How much time? Yeah, ten, minutes. 10 minutes, okay. I will uh, rush up a bit. Um, the reason for going to hybrids, I was in. Uh, I was discussing at it before. We need less um, transmission capacity, and transmission ca capacity is a nightmare in Europe. Uh, Germany is really uh, struggling building new capacity, and it's 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 one of the biggest, in my view, one of the biggest barrier to a successful decarbonisation is that we don't get the infrastructure in place to be able to transport the electrons around. So it's really important to focus on this, reducing the need for transmission. Uh, capacity. So what's in a business case for a, a hybrid uh, is that you come there as an offshore wind farm, you're building, today you're building your radial connection directly to shore, uh, and you have an interconnector connecting two countries. If we go together uh, and build a hybrid instead, you can take away the radial connection and the interconnector, and you can see th that the total cost of the hybrid is reduced with what the radial connection is. Um, I, the cost of the radio connection. Of course, there can be some increasing cost on the, on, on the uh, interconnector. That's what we have seen in the, the German-Danish case, that you choose a longer um, path for your, for your line. Uh, so so the, inf the interconnector become more expensive than in the, the, the baseline. Uh, and of course, you need to, to discuss who to cover that cost and so on. 
But in principle, it means that you are two parties go together and you can have a business case that is lower um, with a lower cost than you will have otherwise. And of course, you should share the benefits and well as well. And that's, that's the model that, that is discussed right now, how to create the market model that, that will create these incentives where two parties go together and save some money. I used to, I like to compare it with the combined heat and power. You have a combined heat and power plant, you can produce power, you can produce heat at a lower cost than you could do if it was two standalone plants. And how do you create an economy in that? You sell your heat for a price that is, that is lower than the standalone heat uh, uh, production, but it's very complicated to say what is the cost of producing one unit of heat and one unit of electricity at a, in a combined plant. So it is a calculation you do where you distribute cost and benefits on the two sides on the heat and electricity. That's what we have been doing for the last 30, 40 years on combined heat and power. And that's the, that's the, um, that's the challenge and that's the, uh, the, the model we need to develop here as well. Um, what do we win from it? Um, you, on the, on, on the, on the, the left-hand side, you have a traditional way of connecting. You connect all the, um, the offshore wind farms into a, a transmission station and you put it into the grid and you transport it through trans, uh, transmission grid down to, for example, Germany. Um, um, and then you maybe do some, uh, you have electrolyzer standing in Denmark producing some, uh, some uh, hydrogen. But with a more hybrid offshore wind project where you move the, uh, the substation out in the shore, you can be able, uh, onshore, uh, offshore, you can connect directly to other countries. Uh, so you can direct directly to uh, Belgium, for example, the Netherlands and Germany. Um, without going onshore where it's difficult, where people live and don't like to watch and, uh, over headlines and don't like to live under them. And then on the other side, um, producing a, a hydrogen, you can also um, build, a, as it just decided in Denmark, uh, together with Germany, to build a hydrogen pipeline going uh, towards Germany to, um, to, the, to the consumers down there. So you create a lot of opportunities uh, also by, by transporting uh, or by moving the, uh, the substation uh, out offshore uh, and being more, a more flexible system. Um, yeah, I won't repeat it. Uh, you can make a lot of modeling showing that this will uh, reduce uh, the need for transmission capacity. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm jumping a bit ahead to, uh, yeah. Um, so also zooming in a bit on Denmark, uh, it's also what's behind the, the Danish um, ambitions. I don't know, maybe if you heard maybe uh, that the politicians came out with a 14 gigawatt ambition offshore wind build out in, in, uh, in Denmark in 2030. Uh, much more wind than Denmark can ever utilize. Uh, I think they calculated that it that it can power 14 million households. Uh, I don't know how many households we have in Denmark, but it maybe two, two and a half, three million. So it's much more than Denmark can ever uh, consume. We don't have a big industry as well. So this is very much with an export view, so that this uh, electricity should be exported to, um, to our neighboring countries. Um, so um, the same story as for Europe, uh, Denmark has the same ambitions. Um, these two islands, um, nice drawings. What we like very much about the Bornholm Island is that we don't need to build an island. We have an island already out there, placed very uh, strategically well in the Baltic seas, uh, close to Germany, close to Poland, co close to Sweden, maybe also to the Baltic countries. Um, so we believe that Bornholm could be a very interesting electricity hub. And um, luckily enough, there's also uh, a large renewable energy um, uh, potential uh, out there. I think it's 100 gigawatt in, in totally uh, in the Baltic seas. So it's, it's really a, a huge area. And, and we think that Bonhart can play a, a very interesting role. Uh, DTU is also, I think even today, DTU uh, announced a report uh, or published a report uh, looking into Bonhart and how that could be an enabler 
for future islands. Um, and that's also for the North Sea where we have to build an island. So that means that the project will be a little longer out in the, uh, the after 2030, it will be only be in 2033, I think still is the target. So to build and uh, physically, uh, really to build a, a construction out there to uh, serve the purpose of an island, uh, that's a very interesting project. Um, so um, yeah, I, I, I don't think I would go in more into detail just to leave some room for questions, but, um, but these are the two projects. Um, yeah. So this came a, a bit into your question before, what is it that we need to make this happen? And it, it's a lot about that the TSOs can take those risks, to, uh, to, to do those investments in, in infrastructure, take the risk that we, we need to develop some model on who should bear the risk. Because in the future where you build an island, for example, you, you expect other countries to connect, but maybe they won't connect from day one. So you still need to run a lot of investments that you're not sure you will get payback. So there is more risk in the future in the decarbonization and who should bear that risk? How should we share them between the consumers, the producers and the taxpayers uh, and between the countries and well. So that's what, what uh, this slide is all about that, that it, we really need, we need that's, that's what we need to discuss. So I will leave it for now just to make room for questions. Um, if you have more than, than you did along the way. Um. <laughs> I would like to start with one question with this. Here in the room now we are talking about sharing and climate, and most of them we are writing big sustainable assets. And maybe I don't know if some of them will be your future partners also. So if you would like to put three keywords into one hundred projects that you think by that are you can have the most impact on the society, or three or four three keys that you think you need to build up to have the most impact in the future. Do you have an idea what sort of keyboard uh, you already mentioned the many, but if you like to say three, do you have any idea for the first one? What would you say? Um, I put one of them up on the slide. You can say. Um, we want to change the world. So, so any innovative ideas and uh, brilliant ideas how to really disrupt the system we have today uh, will be very welcome. So if you've burned from, from focusing on that. Um, and for us though, as a company, we still believe that we are the best in class. So if you wanna be a, a part of the best in class, then you should join us. Um, we have the best track record and it's not to, uh, it, it, it's a, uh, it, it's 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 still real. <laughs> um, we have the best track record in uh, in building, uh, executing on time and on budget. So and it's I was about to say mainly, but it's entirely due to very very good engineering and uh, very very well project managing. So keep your in Danish you will say your penal uh in order, I mean, so we really focusing on the details. So if you're interested in, in getting the details right and to really continue to work on the small issues, getting all the small stuff right to, to be able to, to, to drive the, the industry and make it better and better and better. That's, that's, that's what we hope to work on. And then on the PTX, for example, it's a new technology. It's, uh, I know, I know that, that, that DSU has worked on, uh, on electrolyzers and hydrogen for 40 years, 50 years, and everyone laughed at, at you for a long time and it will never be an industry and suddenly it just kicked up. So to be able to, to catch those upcoming things and go to work every day and, and be interested in, in seeing those developments, that's, uh, I guess that was my, I don't know if you answered your question, but yeah, that's, uh, could be three, three issues. Yeah. Thank you. Any more ideas 